Are you getting anything? calling me when faith is lost and my hope exhausted you will be my strength when my mind says I'm not good enough God you're enough for me I've decided
chaos you see glory from the wreck light is shining through
dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead, you're not done. Greater things are still to come. Oh, I believe if I'm not dead, you're not done. testimony from death to life because grace rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified this is my testimony this is my Lord, thank you for your goodness and that you are strong, not only are you strong, but that you are kind and that you're pursuing us and you're teaching us and letting us grow in you. I pray that you would just give us eyes for you and hearts for you and ears for you and that we would see things the way you see them. We would see people the way you see them, see situations the way that you do. We just learn to trust you and love you more. We thank you for everything you're doing, God. We love you. Amen. Amen. You can be seated. I'm almost ready. Almost ready. Am I on? Now I'm on. Now I'm on. I'm sorry you missed the beginning of what I said. It was like the most amazing thing I've ever said, but it, sorry, it is what it is. This, um, somebody said something about today and what a beautiful, amazing day it is and such a good day. Yes. Such a good day for our, our am I in the right spot here, guys, sound people? Yes. They were telling me where to stand, and, and I have a good memory, but it's short, and I wanted to make sure I was in the correct place. Um, where was I? Oh, yeah. Somebody said something about what a beautiful day for our last outdoor service of the year, and I said, hey, we're fast, fluid, and flexible. You just never know. So we are, uh, uh, we are outdoors on this amazing, beautiful day on this incredible property um, on a Labor Day weekend. What a great uh, crowd. And I think we're able to live stream as well. So those who can't make it here are able to watch live. Um, so I want to start off just by saying, um, I, I'm, I'm not going to mention everybody. I'm just going to hit a couple things. I just want to say thank you because there are so many people that make something like this possible. I mean, every Sunday, there's so many people. But um, I'm standing on our stage, which is actually somebody's trailer, but it's not a trailer, it's a stage. And, and Tom and Nancy get this here every time, and we are so grateful. And Lauren comes out and mows, so you're not in the too high of, of weeds. And, and I'm not 100% sure. I think Brad is the one who gets a porta potty. And we have to move it every time because they put it right there facing everybody. I'm pretty sure nobody's going to want to get up in the middle of the service and go up and open a door and go in a porta potty with everybody's watching. So we, uh, that's where they drop it off. So we always move it and try to face it a different direction. But so many people have done so many things to make this work. I actually went around the perimeter of the property um, this, this week as I was getting ready to sit up. I was praying and, and I hadn't gone around the perimeter in a while. And I don't, I don't know if you can see them from here. Oh, up that way, there's a tree with a bunch of apples on it. And just to the west of that, there are a whole bunch of pine trees. I mean, good sized pine trees. Paul planted those as like little nothing. And, and they're growing into these beautiful pine trees. So there's a whole bunch of people that have done so many things to make this work. So I just wanna say thank you. So this week, obviously, beautiful outdoors. Next week, it might still be beautiful, but we're gonna be indoors, but we're also gonna be outdoors because next week um, is our fall kickoff. Now, I'm excited, I'm excited. I'm not necessarily excited to say, but wait, summer's not over yet. I understand in Minnesota, summer ends, fall begins, the autumnal equinox, it's the September like 22nd at 8.03 or something like that. We're just getting a jump on it because it's the weekend after Labor Day. People, they got kids back in school. Things are going again. And there is some fun, great stuff planned. 
and you don't want to miss it. So we're going to be um, back at the building 9 and 1030 um, next week for the kickoff. You don't want to miss that. Since it's Labor Day weekend, I thought I'd wrap up our series on summer parables um, with a parable about labor. Matthew is the only gospel writer who records this particular parable that Jesus told. Many, I'd say maybe most of Jesus' parables had an element of shock value to them. It got people's attention. It made them think. The parable I want to share with you today could possibly have stunned them maybe more than most of the ones did. I'm going to kind of read through it and I'm going to comment a little as we go and then I'm going to look at some possible lessons for us. So it actually starts, um, if, you, if you looked in your Bible, it would start in Matthew 20, verse 1. But we're actually going to start in Matthew 19 and read the last verse because there's a whole conversation going on between Jesus and the disciples. And he ends with something. And when he tells this parable, he ends with the exact same thing. So I believe they're kind of like bookends telling us a little bit about what's going on here. So in verse 30 of Matthew 19, Jesus says this. And you've heard this before. Many who are first will be last, and many who are last will be first. We've heard that in many contexts. That comes from Jesus. It's actually, like I said, a continuation of a discussion that he's having with the disciples um, about rewards, among other things, about rewards um, in the kingdom, and um, how for believers in Jesus, if you've stepped across that line and claimed Jesus as Savior, then anything, what he tells us is anything that you may have left behind for the sake of the kingdom will be rewarded a hundred times. You realize that's like, yeah, somebody do the math. It's like a thousand percent interest. He said, you'll be rewarded a hundred times plus, and it's funny because it's almost like, and wait, there's more, plus eternal life. That's what he's telling us. He reminds us the kingdom of heaven is upside down when it comes to the world's values. It doesn't fit with what the world thinks or says or how they do it. So that's what he says. The first will be last. Many who are last will be first. And then he tells us a parable to demonstrate what he's talking about. In verse 1 he says, he starts with the word for. And that's important because it's telling us, it's connecting it to what he just said. The first will be last. The last will be first. There'll be rewards. He says for, because of that, the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner. A landowner who went out early in the morning to hire workers for his vineyard. That's where the Labor Day tie-in is. The parable is about workers. It's about their working and their wages and stuff. So you get the picture. There's a guy who owns land. He has a big vineyard on his land, and he needs people to work it, so he's going to hire them. And here's how they did it back then. He goes early in the morning to hire workers. So he goes into town, and all the workers are kind of hanging out, and he finds the ones that are there, and he hires them to work. And it says in verse 2, he agreed to pay them a denarius. Remember from last week we talked about that. A denarius is um, a, a day's wage for a normal common laborer. And so he's a fair person. He's going to give them a day's wage. He said he agreed to pay them a denarius for a day and sent them into the vineyard. Okay? Verse 3, things start to change. At this point, everybody's like, yeah, boring. Been there, done that. Things start to change in verse 3. About nine in the morning, Jesus continues. He went out, the landowner went out, and saw others standing in the marketplace doing nothing. Now, you need to understand that for them, a typical work day was 12 hours. It was like 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., sun up to sundown was typical work day. And actually, in the older translations, it won't say nine in the morning, it'll say the third hour. Because the first hour was six when the sun came up. That's when they hired the first group. And then the, the, the third hour would be 9 o'clock, okay? And then the 6th, the ninth, the whatever. So he says, the third hour, about 9 in the morning, he went out and saw others standing in Mark Place doing nothing. Um, the landowner sees these workers who hadn't been hired by anyone. They weren't working yet. And verse 4, he told them, you also go and work in my vineyard, and I'll pay you whatever is right. So again, he's a fair person. I'll pay you whatever is right. So they went. Now, these are in addition to the workers that were hired first, okay? So he sent more there now. Um, and then he went out again about noon and about 3 in the afternoon and did the same thing. So he's done this in the third hour. He's done this in the sixth hour and in the ninth hour. 
and he did the same thing. So you get the picture. There's four groups. They're all now out working in the vineyard together. And then Jesus adds the final twist. Verse 6, about 5 in the afternoon. Now, if you're doing the math, this is the 11th hour. We hear that phrase often, you know, something happened in the 11th hour. That's where this comes from. The 11th hour, there was only one more hour of work, and that was it. Over, And so at 5 in the afternoon, he goes back into um, town, into the marketplace, and he found still others standing around. And he asked them, why have you been standing here all day long doing nothing? question is a story detail that, that he wants to draw us in. And we listen for their answer, and their answer is, because no one has hired us, in verse 7. You don't have to raise your hand. How many else here were often, like, picked last for things? <laughs> you know, you, you get so excited, and you see everybody's picked, and even so-and-so, who does can't do anything, they're picked before me, what is this? These people are there, it's now 5 o'clock. The workday is going to be over in an hour, and they said, nobody's hired us. They appeared to want to work. They were still there. They said, just nobody hired us. They haven't been chosen to work by any of the other landowners or bosses. So he said to them, verse 7, you also go and work in my vineyard. And I'm sure they're thinking, better than nothing, at least we get an hour, right? So it's 5 p.m., the hour before quitting time, literally the 11th hour of the workday. Verse 8. When evening came, an hour later, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the workers, bring them all in, pay them their wages, beginning with the last ones hired, pay them first, start with them, and then going on to the first ones hired. So he sets this up, he's piquing our curiosity, drawing us in, having us wondering what's going to happen, and it says in verse 9, the workers who were hired about 5 in the afternoon, the ones who came in at the 11th hour, each received a denarius, a day's wage for an hour's work. Who do you think this story, um, in this story, now has their interest piqued? It says in verse 10, so when, when those came who were hired first, they're watching everybody go ahead of them, and the ones that came right at the beginning of the day and worked all 12 hours, they expected to receive more, right? But each one of them also received a denarius. Imagine their surprise and astonishment, watching the people who came in at the 11th hour at 5 o'clock work for an hour and get paid the same as they just got paid. It says, verse 11, when they received it, when this first group received it, they, all of them, that whole first group, began to grumble against the landowner. The complaints started coming in, and they grumbled, verse 12, those who were hired last worked only an hour and you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the work and the heat of the day it kind of sounds like a fair question right we might be asking the same question but like in many of Jesus parables there's a but here's the but verse 13 but he answered one of them I'm not being unfair to you friend didn't you agree to work for a denarius a day's wage. Didn't you agree to that? I find it an interesting detail that the first group, they appeared to all be complaining, all be grumbling, all be saying something, but the landowner directs his response not to the whole group of them, but to one of them. He says to one of them. He makes it personal. It's just an observation. Verse 14, here's what he tells him. Take your pay and go. I want to give the one who was hired last the same as I gave you. See, the landowner the owner says, I, I understand you're upset, but this is how I want to do it. And then he asks a rhetorical question, and he asks kind of an accusing question. He says, verse 15, don't I have the right to do what I want with my own money? And that's a rhetorical question. Obviously, yes, he has the right to do what he wants with his own resources. And then his second question are you envious? Because I'm generous. Because the other guy got what he agreed to, but he says, are you envious because I'm generous? And it's interesting, that's how Jesus ends the parable. 
He then closes the discussion that he's having with the disciples the same way he began it. In verse 16, he says, so, and the so ties this into the parable and it ties it into the statement he made at the beginning. So, based on what you just heard, the last will be first and the first will be last. And he kind of leaves it hanging like he often does. Maybe some of this is confusing to you. And you're saying, I'm not really sure what Jesus is saying here. Because elsewhere, Jesus clearly taught that a worker deserves his wages. In Luke 10, 7, he even says that. He says those words. Somebody who works deserves their wages. We know God notices when people don't treat their employees right. Jesus' brother, James, when he wrote the book of James in chapter 5 and verse 4, he says this, Look, the wages you failed to pay the workers who mowed your field are crying out against you. The cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord Almighty. God notices when employers don't treat employees right. You notice it because you're the one getting mistreated, but God notices it too. God knows when we're not being paid what we deserve. But here's a parable that seems to contradict that idea. So what's going on here? Jesus did not give this parable to teach us about economics, okay? Not the point of the parable. This is not God's view on how a nation should be run. Doesn't matter how long you work, everybody gets paid the same. That's not the point. The parable is not to teach about equality, although we all have equal standing before God. The point is not efficiency, as if those who came in at the last hour somehow did more work. They got more done, you know, and they're entitled to a higher wage because they got a whole day's work done in one hour. It doesn't say that. What this parable is teaching are the principles of the kingdom of heaven. I know that. I know that because in verse 1, that's what Jesus said. It, I'm going to tell you a parable about the kingdom of heaven. We see here that God's ways are different than our ways. You see, the people argued with the landowner in a parable because their ways were different. Their thought process were different, too. And God is saying here, my thought processes are different than yours. My ways are different. In Isaiah 55, he says that. God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. You can't even begin to comprehend what's going on. We think, we like to think we do. I know so many people, they think they got God all figured out. It's like, yeah, don't think so. Don't think so. This parable is one of those parables that reminds us that God is sovereign. He has the right to do whatever he wants with his resources. For me, one of the biggest lessons here is a lesson I learned. I heard um, Kay Warren preach this one time. And it has stuck with me, and it has changed the way I think. It's called, you may have heard me talk about this, it's called the witty principle. The witty principle. This is huge. If you've never heard this, you need to listen carefully. If you've heard it, you need to hear it again. In John 21, Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he's kind of telling them what's going on, and then he focuses it on Peter. They're walking along, he's talking to Peter, and he says in verse um, 18 of John 21, very truly I tell you. Now when Jesus says, very truly I tell you, you should probably listen. He says, when you were younger, Peter, you dressed yourself. You went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands. Someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus was actually, it says in the next verse, Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death by which Peter would glorify God. Jesus is telling him ahead of time, listen, Peter, this is what you did when you were younger. There's going to come a time you're going to stretch out your arms. Someone else is going to dress you, lead you where you don't want to go. He's telling Peter, you're going to be crucified. And then he says, follow me. Now think about that. Peter, you're probably going to die by crucifixion. Because of me, but follow me. Now, if I were Peter, I'd like to think I would do the right thing. I'm sure I wouldn't. But when you just heard Jesus tell you that, 
it should really get your thought processes going. It should really make you start thinking about things. And verse 20, here's what happens. As soon as Jesus says, follow me, Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved. That's John. Remember, John always calls himself that. He saw the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. So Peter's walking with Jesus. He tells him this amazing thing. And what does Peter do? He looks around and sees John back there. Sees John following him. John, to make sure you know it's John, he says, this is the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who's going to betray you? So Peter looks back and sees him. And verse 21, when Peter saw him, he asked, Lord, what about him? See, God, God had just told Peter what was going to happen to him. And instead of being concerned about that, he's concerned about John. What about him? That's, that's a direct quote. Lord, what about him? Jesus answers, If I want him, speaking of John, if I want him to remain alive until I return, and here's the key question, what is that to you? Witty. W-I-T-T-Y. What is that to you? And then he says the same thing to him again. You must follow me. You must follow me. You see, this parable is not about looking over your shoulder. It's not about comparing yourself to the other workers who may have worked less or who may have done less or who may be different in whatever ways. It's not about looking over your shoulder and saying, what about him? What about her? This is about hearing Jesus say, you must follow me. This parable is also about the, the gospel of grace. It shows the sheer outrageous grace of God because we're all saved by grace. That's the only way. Paul wrote, for it's by grace you have been saved through faith. This is not from yourselves. It's the gift of God, not, not by works that no one can boast in Ephesians 2, 8, 9. We're all saved by that grace. That means that the greatest sinner who may have lived the most wicked life can be saved by God, can be forgiven of their sins by God. Just the same as a child who comes to Jesus without having had a whole lot of opportunity to sin. He can save anyone because in one stroke, the blood of Jesus washes away all our sin. A person who receives Jesus on, on his or her deathbed will go to heaven just as sure as someone who's been serving the Lord faithfully for 60 years. In fact, the scandal of the New Testament is that a person can live a righteous life, be moral, upright, highly respected, and so on, and yet still end up in hell. Because it's not that outward thing. It's not what you do that gets you there. It's what Jesus did for you. See, we're talking here about salvation. It's only by grace through faith through Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. We're not talking about rewards, but rewards are another way that this parable can be applied. Our rewards in heaven as followers of Jesus. There are those who have been Christians for years who could, at the end of the day, be saved only by fire. It tells us in 1 Corinthians 3. This is kind of a scary passage. Paul writes, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. Everybody starts there. Ground is level at the foot of the cross. Salvation only by grace through faith in Jesus. He says, nobody can lay any other foundation, which is Jesus Christ. And then verse 12, if anyone builds on this foundation, the foundation of Jesus, using gold, silver, costly stones, or wood, hay, and straw, their work will be shown for what it is because the day, and it's kind of, if you look in your translation, it's capitalized, that day that we stand before him will bring it to light. Everything, he says, will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. And just like they send gold through wood, hay, and the straw. They're saved, but only like one that says escaping through the flames which means you get in the way, 
you get into heaven the way you came into the world with nothing. There's no reward. But then there's those who have been saved for only a little while, and they get to heaven, and there's going to be an amazing reward. And you say, wait a minute, that's not fair. That is exactly what the workers said in this parable that Jesus told. I expect that there will be people in heaven who get a reward I didn't think should get anything. And there will be people in heaven saved by fire who I thought would have an amazing reward. Because it's not about me or what I think or you or what you think. It's about God's sovereignty. He has the right to do whatever he wants with his resources. So on this Labor Day weekend, as our summer is not over, as it begins to wind down a little bit, be thankful if, if you're able to work and have a job. Be thankful because that's not everybody's lot. Be thankful for that. And don't be caught by greed and jealous um, jealous thoughts. It's a trap. Don't, don't be caught by the envy. Remember the witty principle. What is that to you? You know, every time I, I, I question by looking at someone else, and, and in effect I'm saying to God, what about him? What about her? I literally now hear Jesus' voice in my head. What is that to you? This parable calls for grace and justice. The workers were given a job. That's great. They must have felt pretty fortunate or they wouldn't have agreed to it. When God has given us work to do, we feel blessed. It's a high honor to be chosen by him, to be given something to do in God's vineyard. To serve, for instance, to serve the kingdom through joining our church. And it doesn't matter whatever it is, whatever God calls you to do, whether, whether I, I, I'm not even going to start listing because there's hundreds of different things that he calls people to do for the kingdom through joining our church. And when he calls you to do that, that's grace. In spite of everything you've thought, in spite of everything you've been through, he calls you to serve and to work and to be a part of that. But they were not only given the grace of a job in this parable, they were also given justice. It tells us the workers who were hired about five in the afternoon, they came in at the 11th hour, they each received a day's wage. A denarius. So when those who came in were hired first, they expected to receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. Now you might be thinking, wait a minute, how is justice served when people in at the 11th hour get paid the same amount? This is the way that God can be just and merciful at the same time. Because justice means we deserve to be punished. We like to think we're okay and the justice should apply to somebody else. I want to see justice and I want to ask people when they say that, do you really want to see justice? Because that means we get what we deserve and we deserve to be punished because all have sinned. Mercy means God doesn't want to do that. He doesn't want to punish us. When Jesus died on the, on the cross, his blood satisfied divine justice. So now God can save those who come in right at the 11th hour, just as surely as those who have been saved most of their lives. I get that this parable, the message of this parable, may not always seem perfectly clear. What is clear is that God exercises his freedom to give kingdom blessings graciously whoever he chooses and that can cause some shock when we when, when we see that god flips human expectations upside down his ways are not our ways his thoughts are not our thoughts see like the landowner did everybody grumbled but he spoke to one of them jesus is making this personal to you as well i don't know where you're at i don't know what you're thinking I don't know where you're at in your walk with Christ. I don't know if you have a walk with him. I don't know if you've met Jesus yet or if it's just about church. I, I don't know. I would say he's telling you personally. He's asking you questions personally. Make sure you've been adopted into God's family by believing and receiving Jesus as Lord and Savior. Don't count on family. Don't count on friends. Don't count on church to get you in because you can only be saved by grace through faith in Jesus. And when that happens, the next step, build on that solid foundation. Don't waste your life 
building with wood, hay, and straw. That's what the world does because the world is going to tell you that wood, hay, and straw is what's most important. That's what you need to do, they're going to say, over and over and over. And if you do that, if you fall into that trap, at the end, on that day when you stand before him, everything will burn up and you'll be saved as through fire with no reward. And you'll realize, I wasted this opportunity that I had. So we trust and obey and we leave the results to him. We don't worry about the results. We just, when Jesus asks us a question, our answer before the words are out of his mouth, the answer is yes, yes. Whatever it is, yes. I'd like you to bow your heads as we pray. I know that um, we have a lot of people here, a great crowd. We have a lot of people online. We have a lot of people that are, they're not really sure about this whole church thing, this Jesus thing. So as I pray, if, if you've never claimed Jesus as Savior, this is your time. In your heart, it doesn't need to be out loud. Jesus knows your heart. Just say, I understand, Jesus, that I'm a sinner. And I understand that the wages of sin is death and that separates me from you. And I don't want to be separated from you. I want to build my life on that solid foundation of Jesus. And in simple faith, Jesus, I turn to you and I trust you as my Savior. If you've never done that, today is your day to do that. When you do that in your heart, John 1 says we are adopted into his family. We become children of God, and we can begin building on that foundation. And if you've done that 60 years ago or 60 seconds ago, you can build on that foundation with the gold, the silver, the precious stones by just saying yes to whatever he asks you to do. So, Father, we know that there's a lot of people listening to this right now they're still investigating the claims of Jesus. And my prayer is that in simple faith, they would say yes to you today. And my prayer is that those who have already said yes to you would realize that this time is short and this is all we have to build on that foundation that was laid. And so we want to do what's right, leave the results to you and say yes, whatever you ask us to do. We love you. And it's in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please stand for the closing song.
You should get up there faster. <laughs> I love that. There's joy in the house of the Lord today. You say, wait, we're not in the house of the Lord. We're outside. The house of the Lord is not a building. It's people. It says we are the household of God. We are the family of God. If we have claimed Jesus as Lord and Savior, we get adopted into his family and become heirs. So if that's not you, it needs to be you. We're all in this together. We want to we want to we want to be able to help each other build correctly on that foundation. So whatever Jesus is asking of you, say yes. So that you won't hear witty. You know, what is that to you? What is that to you? Don't ask. Just 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 do whatever he says yes. Next week, next week, um, fall kickoff, 9 or 10:30 down at the there is food afterwards. Thank you. I thought you were just saying you're hungry. You want to go out to eat afterwards. Yeah, let's do that. Let's do that. Um, there is food afterwards. There'll be hot dogs and stuff afterwards. There'll be, you'll see some things in the parking lot you're not used to seeing. And if you have kids, your kids will be really excited to see those things. And I think you will have fun too. So 9 or 10.30, um, uh, fall kickoff next week. We're going to be talking about and announcing a few things that you don't want to miss. So be here for that, all right? What am I forgetting? Anything?